Hi guys, uh, we have international master uh, Cyrus Lakhtawala with us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, he's uh, he's one of the he's probably one of the greatest chess authors ever. Uh, I don't I don't know. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to flatter him. Yeah, it's it's a fact. Uh, so, like, sir, what do you do to keep your your book writing ideas like were fresh for you? Like, how do you keep uh, it fresh for you? The writing. Um, I, I'm a I'm a heavy reader. I, I read about two hours a day on any subject, you know, non chess subjects, and okay. uh, <clears throat> I, this these things give me ideas. You know, I, I read a book on science. I read fiction. I read uh, you know whatever. I read I I'm I'm heavy into Buddhism, so I read a lot of uh, Buddhist books and Buddhist scripture. But okay. uh, I. I, I just find that reading uh, gives you ideas, you know, for, it gives me ideas for my books. Uh, my books are not in, um, typical for a chess writer because uh, yeah, I, I've, I always found chess books to be very dry, like, uh, yes. you know, like a, a stockbroker reading ticker tape, you, you know, just numbers. I, I don't like numbers, you know, I want words. And yeah. uh yeah, I, yeah. I want to be a so, real writer. I, I don't want to I, just be a technician. You know? Can I try to uh, spice this interview up a little bit? Like, what uh, what is your opinion uh, on like other uh, writers in the US? Like, can I ask about that? Uh, I think Jeremy Silman is a great writer. Yes. Yes. I think John yeah. Watson is a great writer. Yes. You know, John Watson, by the way, lives about uh, you know three blocks from me. You know. Yes. Uh, we, we both live near. San My wife works at San Diego State University. And okay. his uh, his wife is a professor, and so we live yeah. like three blocks from each other. <laughs> okay, you're uh, talking about Jeremy Silman, right? Pardon me. You're talking about Jer uh, Jeremy Silman, right? No, I'm talking. Jeremy Silman lives. Uh, I'm talking about John Watson. I am John, oh, Watson. John Watson. Oh yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I also okay. think Donaldson is a great writer. He's written a lot of books. I am so John Donaldson. You're saying that. So you're saying that John Watson's books are not dry, right? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's a different style, that's all. Like, uh, a lot of people don't like my books. They hate, in fact, they hate my books. I'm, um, I'm simultaneously, I would say, the most loved and the most hated chess writer in the world. Because uh, I, have, I have what you would call super fans, where uh, I get uh, yeah. messages every day on, uh, on Facebook. I, I get Facebook Messenger messages like three, four a day saying, oh, my God, what a great writer you are. But yeah. I, I think there's a percentage of, of people who think, oh, my God, you are the worst writer in the world. You know, I, okay. I, I think it's like maybe 20% uh, of the people really hate my style because they find it distracting to the chess. Because yeah. I, I write a lot and I use a lot of humor. Um, I try to, uh, I don't differentiate chess from life. Yes. And so I... I, I put in life situations and relate them to the chess situation that's happening at the board. And I know that uh, one time I made the mistake, I, I posted, you know, this is my, you know, 39th or 38th chess book, and I posted it on Facebook. And I thought, you know, maybe why am I just doing friends? I usually only do friends who can see it. So I put it on public, right? And I got my usual, oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. And then I got like, oh, vomit emoji, uh, poop emoji. <laughs> you know, like, I, I oh, hate sure. your books. I hate them. I hate them. Yeah. And I went, uh, I better not do public. You know, I better do back to friends, you know. Okay, like many of these, many of these readers are uh, reading the book only for the sake of the instructional value, right? They're not reading it like... Yeah, I've so. got people who actually read my books just for the writing, just for the prose. Yeah. They, yeah. they buy the book. No. They tell me they don't even play the opening, but they like the writing style so much they buy the book. Yeah, that's but, what I was but, saying. Like some people hate your bo uh, your book because, <laughs> like, uh, they think that this doesn't have instructional value. You you like <laughs> you uh, you're writing a lot and yeah, things that, like that's that. Some people feel that fallacy way. though. That's a fallacy. I mean, I I won in nine in nine. Not nineteen, twenty seventeen. Um, my book, Chess for Hawks, won instructional book of the year for um, American Chess Journalists Association. So they have to be somewhat instructional if you win yes, instructional yes. book of the yes. year. So I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. I'm saying that your critics, yeah, 
Follow New Yorker. I think I am instructional. It's just that the the extra prose and the humor bothers them, and and yeah. it's it's just the it's the humor mainly and the prose the 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 writing style that I have that bothers them. You're and, interested uh, in science too, right? You're interested in science, right? I, I'm interested in everything. A writer yeah. <laughs> is interested in everything. I mean, there's no subject I'm not interested in. But uh, I read all sorts of books. I read philosophy, science, fiction. I read uh, everything. Horror. A any any genre, I read it. You know. What is your like? What is your sh uh, schedule like? How when do you read and when do you write and all that? Um, I. As you may have guessed, I don't sleep much. Okay, I, I okay. write. I write forty hours a week, and I teach about between twenty and twenty-three hours a week. And so, okay. I, I, if I was smart, I would do it the other way. By the way, you know, my life would be a lot less hectic if I did it the other way. But uh, my schedule is: I get up, I get up at about five a.m. every day. I meditate for an hour and a half till six thirty. Then I start writing until about 10 a.m. Or, or maybe yeah. like 9.45 a.m. Then I go to the yeah. gym. And at the yeah. gym, um, I, I like to get myself into a daydream meditative state. And okay. uh, what, what happens is in the morning, if, I, if I'm working on a game that day for, for my book, okay, okay, I write the technical part of the game in the morning. Okay, from six okay. thirty to oh, yeah. nine twenty-five. Okay. Yeah, and I get the pros. The pros I create at the gym when I'm there for about an hour and a half. Oh, uh, yeah. I just sort of daydream, and I have the game in my head, and then the prose starts uh, coming in. But I need to be in a in a, a distracted state, like I need to be on a treadmill or in the pool, where I'm just sort of. Uh, in a daydreaming mode and that's and w and then I come home and then I fill out the game with prose and it feels like it goes from black and white to color when I do that it, it's like uh you know when Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz uh when she was in Kansas it was in okay. sepia black and white and then as, she, as soon as she got to Oz everything turned to color it's like that when the prose enters the game the game suddenly comes alive um and that's okay. what I try for uh, the other, uh, uh, and then I then I teach later in the day, you know. But I, I write more, and then I teach mainly at night. Uh, but that's my schedule, and I work seven days a week. I don't take any time off. I don't have a a day off. There's no such thing, you know. Even when okay. we go on vacation, my wife insists no lessons. But uh, I tell her I cannot do less than four hours of writing a day. I, I, you know, you're going to make me fall behind schedule, so you must give me four hours for my writing. And I actually yeah. sneak in about six, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when do you read, like, other stuff? Like, not, not just... Other stuff uh, in the afternoon. When I get burned out, I read for about two hours in the, in the late afternoon I read. From about one to three, I read about uh, from about one to three because at that time I feel like I need a rest, you know, like I'm, I'm the brain, it, I, yeah. I don't want to just be in chess all the time or I'll get burned out. Yes, you ask yes. me how I, how I don't get burned out, it's by reading. Yes. It, that, that two hour break somehow unburns me out, you know. Yes. So. Yeah, and it's like uh, uh, I'm a I'm a beginner in chess, but I'm not. I'm not, But uh, I I have also found that when I when I read a book and then I start uh, playing chess again, like there is like a definite improvement in my uh, playing. Well, you're. Yeah, you're I, I've, also, I've also seen that. Perspective has changed. By the way, it is not important if you're a beginner. What you, you know? What the key um, the key thing in chess is love of the game. That's it. You have to love the beauty of the game. I actually uh, think the the entire philosophy of the chess world is completely wrong. Like uh, every student that comes to me, you know, like the question, how can I improve? How can I improve? Um, is there instructional value in this book? I, is there instructional? I want to get better. I want to get better. Um, just just play chess for the beauty of the game. Let your it, let the getting better be a natural process. Don't try to force it. You know, just loving the game, playing. You know, playing over games, looking. You know, reading books, going over videos. Although I 
I, before this interview, I, I went on an anti-video rant, you know, yeah. with Arun, so he already knows my hatred of uh, non-reading, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think video is, is a very lazy way to study chess. I, I have tried many, many times in my life to watch a chess video. Um, my, the number of videos I've, I've watched from beginning to end is zero. I, I, I go nuts, you know, like it's too slow for me. It's like, uh, you know, you turn the video on and, you know, chess, the royal game. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, get to the game. Stop okay. doing the introduction. Come on, come on, you know. Okay. But then, the, you know, when, you, uh, when you talk about playing chess, uh, you, uh, you don't mean blitz. You, do you include blitz and rapid also in that, like uh, the I, shorter format? Do you I include was a, that? I was an incredibly good blitz player in my... Uh, prime about 25 years ago i uh i could hang with the best players in the world i i, I broke even with kasparov in a three-game match in 1996 i beat i beat shiroff 4-0 in 1996 when he was ranked in the top five in the world i, w I was like a really top-notch blitz player i was much weaker in tournament because i have some health issues uh with uh chronically bad back and so when i play a long tournament i i'm in pain and so it reduces my my playing strength to be in constant pain uh but blitz you you play a little your back hurts you go you know so the pain issue isn't there with blitz but uh i basically got better and better via study and blitz what i would do is i would study and then what I would apply what I studied in the Blitz games. Blitz is actually very valuable for your opening repertoire because yeah. uh, let's say <laughs> you just play slow games, okay? You test well, them out, right? I need five years to, if I'm playing some line of the Roy Lopez, I need five years to play 30 games in that line. You play Blitz, I can, I can do that in one week. I can get 30 games of experience. Now, they're crappy games, okay? Especially if you play three minute. If you play five minute, a little better. 15 minute, a little better. But um, you... You can accumulate experience very quickly. I know that Yasser Serwan, who's a friend of mine, uh, he basically became a world-class grandmaster via blitz alone. Nothing more. Just blitz, 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 you know? Yeah. And he got better and better. Yeah, but I think uh, I've, I've, I've read uh, German, uh, Jeremy Silman say like that uh, blitz is not good for chess there's improvement a, and all that. Yeah, there are a lot of masters who say sure, that, right? Sure, sure. There's a, there's a different... Bodvinik said Blitz was awful for your chest. It, it depends on how you deal with Blitz, okay? Blitz can make you very superficial because uh, you look at a position for 10 seconds and if you play a lot of Blitz, you get the impression that you you understand the position completely after 10 seconds. Of course, that's not the case. You don't even understand 1% per of what's going on in front of you. So... Uh, Blitz has that danger of uh, the creep of superficiality into your game. And that's a problem if, if you do that. But if you, if you discern and say, hey, this is a, you know, a slow game, it's not a blitz game, I'm going to use my time, then in blitz is actually very valuable. But I, I do hear, I do understand that, that philosophy. And some of my students, I have told not to play Blitz because, you know, they, they play in these tournaments. And uh, I teach a lot of top-ranked juniors uh, right now. And, uh, you know, they play uh, in these tournaments and they drive me nuts. They, you know, they, they play 20 moves in five minutes and they're way out of their book. They should be thinking. And it's because they play Blitz too much. Yes, yeah. yes, so, yes. So I understand that. It, I think it goes from person to person, basically. If you're if you're intelligent enough to know to play slowly in a slow game, then blitz is fine. If you're addicted to blitz and you keep wanting to play blitz in your tournament games, then you should not play blitz. <clears throat> yeah. So, so like um, we were talking about uh, blitz, right? Yeah. So, like um, this is <laughs> what I understood from our conversation, like. Uh, if you're going to try and play blitz, like uh, you, you've got to bring new ideas to each game. You can test these ideas out, uh, and like you can bring new opening variations. You can you can try a new yes. sacrifice, yes. things like and that, you, right? You, you should you should not play blindly, right? You shouldn't play you blindly. 
the thing is, Blitz is meaningless. Who cares if you lose a Blitz game? It's not really rated. I mean, I don't care about the Blitz rating. So you can experiment in a Blitz game. You can try something crazy. Uh, you, you're, you're much more afraid to do that in a real game, in a tournament game. So that's the value of Blitz. You can try things. You can, uh, you can just let yourself, your creativity flow in a Blitz game. Uh, where in, there's a there's kind of a tendency to contraction in a in a slow game because of the importance of it. You you, you don't want to lose in a slow game, but in a blitz game, who cares if you lose, right? It's like monopoly money. My my blitz rating will go up and down a hundred points in one day. Who cares, right? I know yeah. if I lose a hundred points, I can gain it right back the next day. If I have an off day, next day will go right back up. So who cares? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I think I have heard uh, Hikaru Nakamura saying that, like Ishita, he uh, tries out like uh, different openings and uh, yeah. during blitz sessions. Yeah, that's the thing. There's no penalty yeah. for losing. Yeah, even so, I think even Super Grandmasters try it out, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, do you play on any website right now, like Chess.com, Chess Twenty Four? Where do you play? Uh, right now? I play very little because my schedule is insane. I mainly play students when we test out an opening. I okay. uh, see. I, I live in San Diego, uh, California, and uh, we have a, a a tournament here uh, called the Gambito, and it's yeah. every every Saturday. Um, I go there every Saturday. I don't play every Saturday. I'm too busy, but, but I play every two weeks right now. And uh, a lot of my students play there. And uh, it's game 45 with five-second time delay. So basically all our games, virtually 80% of our games, come down to a blitz game. Now, it's not a yeah. fair blitz game all the time. One side could have six minutes and the other side could have one. But it's okay. essentially a blitz game. So I... For all the students that play in the Gambito, I reserve the last 15 minutes of a lesson to play bullet chess. I always okay. play the one-two, like one-minute game with two-second increments. And okay. uh, <clears throat> also, it gives them a good chance to beat me because I'm an old man. And like one minute for me is like I can make only one move in one minute, you know. Okay. So I, so if, if uh, I teach uh, many kids here, and so... Uh, it gives them a chance to beat me. They won't beat me in a, a tournament game yet. I mean, they, I have some students that are pretty strong. I have one that's 12 years old. That's 2,300. And I have another one that's about 14 and 2,300. So, okay. uh, do you offer personal lessons right now? I do personal lessons. Yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, well, um, I mainly take, uh, people who live here, uh, but, uh, I, I'm, I decline students all the time just because the demand for students is far more than the time I have to give. So I have a limit of, uh, you know, like I say, 20 to 23 hours per week. I won't go over that because I, I know what I can take. And I know right now that uh, 60 plus hours a week is, is pushing it for a workload. And I'm not going to go to 70, especially at my age. I'm turning 59 soon. So... I, I feel this right now. I'm re, I've been doing this for this workload for about uh, 10, 11 years, and I'm feeling it. The, like you're not supposed to work for 60 hours a week when you're 59. You're supposed to, you know, uh, have an easier life. When, I think. You know? When you're talking about work, you're not including the writing, right? Yeah, I'm, include including, I'm including writing and teaching. Yeah. Yeah, so these lessons are given at home, right? At your home? Or at yeah, at my house. Yeah, they either come, they either come over or we do them via Skype and ICC. Okay, I, I think I've heard that you play at some club, right? You play at a nearby club, right? Yeah, I play, I play in this Gambito every two weeks. I do this because mainly, um, I actually hate to play and wish I could retire, but uh, I I play because, uh, I one, I feel that if you stop playing, you're going to lose your playing strength. Like, you know, as you get older, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. I, I was around 2,600, uh, and that, that was when the ratings were deflated 25 years ago. And for the first time in 35 years, my rating fell below 2,500. So it's a, it's a disorienting feeling to get worse and worse every few years because age just, you know, nobody escapes age. Uh, and I, 
but I, I feel I'm still playing at a pretty decent level. And I think that's because I'm completely absorbed in chess all the time. I'm, I'm in a lesson or I'm writing a book, but I'm always, I've always got chess in front of me. And I think very few chess players have that much chess in their life. Yeah. I as think I do. Is it because you have, uh, you uh, get new ideas all the time? Like you're, you're not starting. No, I need to feed my books. I need to feed my books with my games. It's my trademark. I, I put my, no matter what opening I write, I try to put my games in the books because, um, I don't want that email of how dare you write a book on uh, this opening when you don't play it, you know? So I always, I always play the, uh, I learn the opening that uh, if I'm writing a book on uh, an opening I've never played, I learn it and then I play it. And then I, I make sure I include a few of my games. I try to include about six of my games in a book of about 60 games. So 10%, you know? Uh, do, you, do you use engine analysis a lot? Well, I have to for my books because you can't uh, you can't say I hate all technology and then overlook a mate in one and then the thirteen hundred player messages you hey isn't that a mate in one you missed you know like oh, yes uh, you you have to use engines when you write the books but what I do is I try and uh, sorry I'm moving all over the place yeah that's, that's, uh, that's I I, yeah, that's, yeah. I what I try to do is. Uh, I, I first go over the game without an engine, always, because I, I want the human uh, perception first. And then I, ha then I use the... Oh, darn it. Something happened here. My, I just yeah, turned yeah. on Spotify accidentally. You see how much I hate technology? <laughs> Spotify just came on. Like, what, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I... I I'm very anti-computer. I think they um, they give us instant answers, kind of like um, how nobody can do math anymore. Kids can't do math anymore because they ha all have calculators. They they don't do arithmetic anymore uh, yeah, yeah. because of calculators. I once yeah, went yeah. to um, I this was a long time ago. I mean, uh, very very long time ago. Because it was at a McDonald's, and I've, I've been a vegetarian since the 1987. I, I'm a vegan now, but, you know, I don't go to McDonald's, okay? But this was way, way back when I was in my 20s. And I remember uh, ordering something, and uh, the, I guess the, the little picture of the whale, you know, when you order filet of fish, they, have a, they punch a little picture of a whale, and the thing didn't work. And so she actually had to do math and actually had to give me back my change without the machine. And she was just panicked. Like the manager was called. And I, I said, uh, you know, it's like 60 cents change. It's, you know, I gave you three bucks. It was like 240, uh, 60 cents, you know. And she was, no, no, wait, wait. I, the machine, the machine. She could not give me the change back unless yeah, the machine yeah. told her to give me back the change. Yeah, I think th I think this problem is a little, um, like, it's an American problem. I think in India, it's oh, is is it? le less common, I think. I think so. Oh. I'm not sure. I, I oh. think so. Yeah, in India, it's uh, not common, I think. Oh, it's not yeah. common. Okay, because yeah. I, I read, I just, I read that uh, Inuits, you know, the, the Eskimos mm -hmm. in the northern regions of Canada, um, in the for for millennia, okay, millennia, they could wander uh, miles and miles and miles from their home camp, okay, and not get lost. Remember, there's there's no markers there. It's just all snow. Like what? Like which direction is which? Which like which way am I going? It's just all snow. And if you go twenty miles away on a hunt from your camp, you don't know which way the camp is. But somehow these these Inuits always could track their way back, even in a blizzard. You there's no, uh, you know, you can't follow the sun. You don't know which is east or west. Yet they know, even in a blizzard, they they can go back twenty miles. Then what happened was. Um, uh, GPS was introduced on the snowmobiles, and within one generation, it, uh, people would die because they would go 25, 30 miles away from their home base, their snowmobile would break down, and they had no way, they had to walk back, and they wouldn't know how to get back to their home camp, and they would freeze to death. 
And this is a, a like a very recent thing. It just took two generations to lose the power of direction. And it's because of technology. They relied on technology, so something was lost that they had, but now they don't have. And I think technology does that. Like, I, I watch, uh, you know... I watched the World Championship match. Uh, I just had an interview yesterday, so I'm repeating exactly what I said in that interview. I had a podcast yesterday, but uh, I, I watched the you know the Carlson uh, Caruana match, and uh, everybody has their computers on. I never use my computers when watching one of these things. I want to use my my actual brain, and yeah. uh, you know. The computer gave some incredible, impossible to see variation for Carlson. This was in the yes, first yes, game of the match. Yes, yes, and yes. Carlson yes. would have won. Okay, and then when Carlson didn't do it, oh, oh my God, Carlson is so weak. What a fish! Oh, he's so weak, so weak. And these are like you know, sixteen hundred players, fifteen hundred players saying this, and they're yes. saying this because they have the answer right in front of them. The computer just handed them the answer. I mean, do they really believe they would have found the continuation that Carlson yeah. missed? Of course not, yeah. right? Yeah, but it, it gives you the illusion. It made as a 50-something move, or something, right? I don't remember, but it was a forcing line that yeah, you know, that was, could have been like plus six, and, yeah, and Caruana resigns. But he didn't see it because it was too hard to see. A human can't see stuff like that, you know? Yeah, I but, think there, uh, there is a Norwegian supercomputer named uh, Sesse, Sesse, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. Is that how it's pronounced, Sesse? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I really it's, don't. it's either Sess or Sesse. But I was, I was looking at the Sess as, as the match was going on. And uh, by the way, can computers have nationality? So it's, everybody tells me it's a Norwegian computer, you know, like, like as, as if the computer has a nationality. But yeah, I know what you mean. The, 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 yeah. the programmer is, is They Norwegian. manage it or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I was looking at the SES lines, too, uh, like live. But, but, um, but I turned it off, too. You know, I would turn it off. Like, I, I don't want to be constantly flooded with what the computer tells me. I want to have my own perceptions when I look. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know whether I'm remembering this correctly, but uh, Carlson did lose one game. Like, it was, it was a clear win, right? He did lose one game. And I mean... Yeah, yeah, there was one yeah. which was a clear win, right? Not lose the game. I mean, I mean, uh, there was one draw which was a clear win, right? Uh, well, Caruana was winning. Of course, every game of the slow match was drawn, right? In the yeah. Carlson Caruana. Yeah, apart from and, that, yeah. And, but uh, Caruana was was clearly winning one. That was a Petrov. The second Petrov, he was clearly winning. But it was also too difficult. Carlson defended brilliantly and held the yeah. draw in that game. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Carlson also was winning one game, right? Oh, he, really? was winning, uh, he was winning quite a... I think maybe more than one, yeah. The first one, he was clearly winning. Yeah, we're not talking and, about the mate, uh, checkmate in 50 moves or something like that. I'm talking about, uh, like, he could have converted into a better MDM or something like that. There was one oh, game. Yeah, there were many... Uh, both sides missed many... Possibilities. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, you, not, I'm not saying that I saw any of those books. I'm not. Say, I'm not claiming right. that. No, no, I understand. I understand. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, both sides missed many, many possibilities. But that's that's chess. You know, where the yeah. human brain. Yeah, but, yeah I think can't it comprehend. I no, sir. But I think um, um, uh, people expect a lot from Magnus, right? I I think it's because of that, right? No, because they said the same thing about Caruana. Oh, he's weak. He's weak. You know, it's if the like, computer gives you if you put if you have a computer giving you the instant answers. It's a it's like this magic answer genie. It gives you instant answers right in front of you. They get the impression that they too would would find these moves. That it's all obvious. Of course, of course, I would have played that exact same fifteen move combination. No, you wouldn't. You would not have found the fifteen move combination. The computer gave it, but the delusion is that you would. 